Okay, so we are a few minutes after seven and thank you for joining us tonight. We will get into tonight's talk with Dr. Kadeski. I wanted to welcome everyone on behalf of Trio Fertility. My name is Tavia and the talk you are attending tonight is with Dr. Ken Kadeski here on the screen. I also want to let you know that um, you'll also see on the screen Alex, um, Alex Couch, and she is um, someone who's come on board with us at Trio, and she does outreach with our medical community and um, is going out and doing educational sessions and things like that. So you might see her around your doctor office. Um, you also might get follow-up emails regarding this if you're looking for the video or our newsletter or anything like that. So, uh, so you can put a face to the name. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Kadeski. So Dr. Ken Kadeski is one of the founding partners at TRIO, and he is also the medical director at TRIO, has been practicing um, fertility for oh, over 25 years, I, mean, it, I think. That. I don't know how long, and I'm <laughs> going to pass it on over to him um, so he can take us through tonight's session on optimizing sperm health in male factor infertility. Perfect. Thanks, Tavia. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about male fertility. And, and the, the interesting thing is this has only become popular probably over the past less than 10 years. So most fertility investigations and treatment focused on a woman coming in, uh, undergoing treatment, frequently undergoing therapy, and very rarely, in fact, when I first started, it was shocking that that men very rarely participated at all. And I'm going to show you some stats here now uh, showing you why we have to focus on both sides of the equation. So I'm going to put my screen share up. And here we go. And let me just get this into. Oops, sorry, I have to. Uh, well, we can do it this way. I just got to flip it back to the beginning. Okay, so uh, we're going to be talking about uh, import uh, the important things you have to think about uh, in terms of fertility and male fertility, at least with respect to today's talk, uh, why it's important. So. This is just a bit of a background. Uh, most of you know, in fact, probably all of you know, the definition of infertility is a couple who's been trying to get pregnant for over a year and has been unsuccessful. But it does change. If a woman is over 35, <coughs> we lower it to they've been trying for six months. And in fact, in part of your history, if her cycles are not coming monthly, you don't have to wait six months. You can just bring this couple in right off the bat. But the classic definition is uh, one year of unprotected intercourse for when the woman is under age 35. And it is significant. So 15% of couples, all couples are infertile. Um, Dr. Kadeski, we can't see your, can you reshare your screen? Can I reshare my screen? Okay. Yeah, I just go up to the thing again. Okay, give me a sec. Oh, it's not doing it. So give me a second here. Um, go to the Zoom. It should show up at the bottom again. Okay, here, let's try it again. Uh, can you see that? Yep. And can you see that? Yep. Okay, sorry about that. I have no, no idea what happened. So again, one year of trying without success, and it's significant enough that it affects 15% of all couples who are trying to get pregnant. Uh, how's it distributed? So it isn't 50-50 really. 30% uh, of the time it's female factor, 30% of the time it's male factor, 30% it's combined, and 10% of the time it's still unexplained. And interestingly enough, when I present my next slide, previously unexplained infertility accounted for 60% of fertility problems. And why has it changed? 
So this is a cool concept in terms of thinking of fertility. Um, there's macro fertility and micro fertility. Macro fertility is basically all the pipes, all the plumbing, all the parts that need to be open and working so we can get the sperm and the egg to meet each other. Micro fertility only occurs once the sperm sees the egg. So sperm sees the egg, swims over, pops its lid for a little drill to come out, drills into the egg, transfers its genetic information inside that egg. Underneath that eggshell, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of steps. They finally form a single cell embryo. That single cell embryo has to divide, get bigger, crack out of its original eggshell and plant in the uterus. But we knew nothing about microfertility until we started doing IVF and retrieving eggs. Prior to that, all you saw was follicles in the ovary. A follicle is a balloon filled with water that either has an egg inside or doesn't. Eggs are too small to see, and the only time we can see eggs are when we remove them. So when I say 60% of fertility problems were unknown or unexplained, it's changed significantly since we have that definition of microfertility. Um, so couples are probably going to be coming to your office and asking, A, do we have a problem? And B, what should we do with it? Or what do we do about it? And um, I'm going to be talking about the anatomy. Well, you can see it here. I'm going to be talking about uh, male anatomy and physiology, specifics about male fertility and how we can deal with them. This is just a quick can you see my pointer, by the way, anyone? No? Yes. yes? Yep. Okay. So uh, a good way of thinking about it is the testicles, the factory, the testicle produces sperm. All this collecting system is the highway that leads to the outside world. Okay. And you can either have problems with the factory or you can have problems with the highway. <laughs> And there are a lot of different factors that can lead to male infertility. And I'm going to go through a few examples of each just because they're important. Uh, hormonal issues, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, diabetes, um, hypogona, uh, 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 underactive pituitary gland that isn't stimulated in the testes. In terms of immunological causes, well, interestingly, when a man has a vasectomy and he decides to reverse the vasectomy, if it's over seven years for his vasectomy, he's developed sperm antibodies. <clears throat> and because of those sperm antibodies, his sperm cannot naturally get an egg pregnant. They need IVF. So if someone's contemplating vasectomy and they've had it longer than seven years, really try and dissuade them from doing it because they're going to need IVF no matter what. I'm going to go through various different medications and drugs that can affect sperm and male performance. Uh, urogenital infections, uh, gonorrhea can have an effect. Mumps or chitis can a teenage boy, a teenage boy that gets mumps will very frequently end up becoming sterile because it destroys all the sperm producing uh, uh, sperm producing cells. Uh, there are environmental toxins. Some guys work in very toxic environments. Uh, there are genetic causes, chromosome issues, balanced translocations. Obviously, sexual dysfunction. If this man is not able to produce sperm, they're certainly going to have a tough time getting pregnant. Uh, surgeries. Uh, a man has prostate surgery uh, for an enlarged prostate. Uh, a lot of times, it destroys the valve uh, between the prostate gland and the bladder. So when he ejaculates, he has retrograde ejaculation. His sperm go backwards into the bladder, which is a complete disaster. There are urogenital abnormalities, uh, which I'll talk about, meaning undescended testes. There aren't many malignancies that uh, affect fertility, but if there's a malignancy, sometimes it's the last thing in a couple's mind. Um, I'm going to go through a few causes. Varicocele is a 
uh, varicose vein of the testicle. There's great debate every five years as to whether or not it's significant or not. It probably is. The prevailing theory now is that it probably won't improve a man's sperm, but if the varicocele is dealt with, it can prevent further deterioration. Uh, just as an aside, if your patient comes to you and says, I've been told I have a varicocele and needs to be fixed, it can be fixed surgically, which you should definitely, definitely discourage. It's a fairly brutal operation and painful. It can easily be, be done by embolization. Uh, uh, it, it can be done by radiological embolization. It's a day procedure where the man is in and out. Again, you don't know if a varicocele is going to have an effect for six months. So a lot of times it, they don't want to wait six months to see if it, if it worked. Surprisingly, gout is uh, a cause of poor sperm function. Uh, high uric acid levels can screw up sperm. Interestingly enough, allopurinol can also uh, screw up sperm. There are genetic causes. So in males that have cystic fibrosis or are cystic fibrosis carriers, they, at least 90% of them have what's called CBAVD, congenital bilateral absence of vas deferens. In other words, going back to the factory and the highway, they're born without highways when they have cystic fibrosis, and there's no way of getting them back. So they have testicles that produce sperm, but there's no way other than retrieving sperm of getting it to the outside world. I mentioned immunological causes. I mean, there are even more significant immunological causes in men who, let's say, have had uh, transplant who transplants who are on immune suppressing drugs. These can have an effect on sperm. Uh, we mentioned infections. We mentioned undescended testes. I'm going to talk about lifestyle, which is huge, but uh, we'll leave that for another slide. And by the way, if you have questions, if it's pertinent to the slide, please type it in. Otherwise, I'm quite willing to answer any questions at the end. Um, so they come into your office and uh, there's a couple of questions that are important. You want to find out if they've ever been pregnant before. Uh, you want to find out if they've had any kind of surgery. Does the guy have gout? And is he able to not only maintain an erection, is he able to ejaculate? Because that's really the end game that's needed. Um, in terms of history and medications. So, and I have a tough time with this with men who are on Propecia and Rogaine for hair loss. These are uh, 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 these are um, uh, five prime five prime. The, these are these destroy the enzyme that that produce testosterone. Men who are on Propecia and Rogaine very frequently have low sperm counts. I see a number of men who go to their family doctor and complain of de decreased energy, decreased libido and they're put on testosterone, putting a man on testosterone is the equivalent of putting a woman on the birth control pill. It renders their, I see most men who, who are on testosterone replacement have sperm counts of zero, okay? So always think twice when the man, you're, you're, it's really a balance as to uh, whether or not you should, you can't, you just can't treat their decreased libido with testosterone. There are other, uh, there are other uh, uh, remedies for this. Uh, an undescended testes, so they're probably about 5% of male babies have undescended testes. The prevailing previous thought used to be that the undescended testes, because they haven't descended into the scrotum, they're within the body, there's no sperm production. That isn't probably what happens. It's probably because undescended testes are part of a syndrome that gives a guy, it gives this boy, eventual man, just poor sperm production right from the very beginning. So it isn't the, the, un, the fact that the, the, the undescended testes isn't the cause, it's sort of the symptom of an overall genetic problem. We mentioned mumps arcitis. If 
a boy has mumps as a teenager, very frequently he has a spermia and testicular torsion, testicular injuries. Uh, if you destroy the vasculature of the uh, uh, of the testicle, you're going to have trouble with sperm as well. So these are all very, very important questions you can ask when you're interviewing the couple. And just as an aside, if if someone has booked an appointment for because they're having trouble getting pregnant, both partners should be there for that appointment. Okay. Otherwise, they play broken telephone and uh, you don't get your story across to them. Um, so let's talk about other things in history. What's his occupation? Is he working in a mine and inhaling toxins? Travel is huge. If a man is, let's say, a traveling salesman and he's never around when his wife is ovulating, they're obviously going to have difficulty with their timing in getting pregnant. Pick a part of the body and tell me stress doesn't affect it. So there's no reason to think that that the uh, reproductive tract is immune from stress. This is an important this is an important one. Smoking. Uh, cigarettes have dioxin. Cigarettes have nicotine in them. It's been estimated since sperm is on a three month assembly line. It takes three months for the testicle to form a sperm. One cigarette. One cigarette in three months can it cut the fertility of sperm up to eight times. Very significant. Um, as well as the almost for sure effect it's going to have on erections in the future. So again, if the guy doesn't care about his fertility, he may care about his ability to have erections and cut down. Uh, alcohol can be good for fertility. It's been estimated that seven glasses of alcohol per week Ideally, red wine, because red wine has a uh, an antioxidant called resveratrol. Seven glasses of wine per week, no more than two in one day. And if they have two in one day, it counts towards a seven total. Can uh, can improve fertility. More than that, uh, more than that gets progressively worse and worse and worse. It affects hormones. It affects erections. It affects sperm production. Marijuana may have the same effect as tobacco. That's still being looked into. Vegetarians. So vegetarians have high beta carotene levels. Beta carotene is a hormone receptor blocker. So there are men we see who are vegetarians and uh, are, again, either having trouble with erections or having trouble with sperm count. It's not that they can't be vegetarians what you should probably do with these people is order a beta carotene level and see how high it is. And if it is very high, you should probably uh, have a consultation with a nutritional counselor so they can do some dietary adjustment. They don't have to run off to the keg the next day. Um, so what are the macro for you guys can't do microfertility investigations. I mean, you got to do IVF to do microfertility investigations. But what macrofertility investigations? I'm going to hold off with DNA fragmentation for now. But you can certainly order a semen analysis, and I'll give you normal values in a second. But if the semen if the semen analysis values are low, don't wait. Just send them off. They they need to be looked at. And my my urology colleagues are wonderful, but they're fairly unilaterally thinking. They don't think, they they just, they fix things, but they don't do fertility therapy. So if there is a male problem, send them to a reproductive endocrinologist and we will make the connection with the urologist because what will happen, they'll see the urologist say, yep, you have a low sperm count. Now I have to get you to see someone who knows how to treat you, uh, how to treat you as a couple. So get a general semen analysis, see what it looks like. Blood work, you can get their hormones, you can get their gonadotropins, check their thyroid. I mean, if they're diabetic, do their hemoglobin A1C. An ultrasound, I mean, you can do a physical exam. I mean, I think I could probably, if I did a physical exam on a guy, figure out a varicose seal, but an ultrasound is just as good. An ultrasound of testes 
will tell you whether or not he has a varicose. And you don't do it if the man has normal sperm parameters anyways. So these are normal values with the World Health Organization, volume more than two cc's, sperm count over 15 million, motility 50%, and morphology 10%. So uh, if you can either write that down, or again, Tavi is recording this, so you can always get back to it just so you have it as a reference. But they give you the normal they give you the normal values when you order seam analysis, anyways. I'm going to talk about a DNA fragmentation test, uh, something we do. I'm proud to say we're probably one of two places in all of Canada who do DNA fragmentation tests. Um, in order to form a pregnancy, half the information comes from the sperm, half the information comes from the egg. If enough of the DNA in the sperm is fragmented, broken up into pieces, there's not enough there to give a healthy pregnancy. So a high degree of DNA fragmentation in the sperm is significant. I'll show you a I'll show you a requisition form so you can see. But if over 25% of the DNA in sperm is fragmented, they have a much lower chance of getting pregnant. And if they do get pregnant, they have a much higher chance of miscarriage. A question I'm all, I'm frequently asked. Does it lead to does it lead to fetal abnormalities? And the short answer is no. It's an all or none. Okay, they it 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 it, it won't give you Down syndrome. It won't give you autism. And the interesting thing about a DNA fragmentation is that the man can have completely normal sperm parameters. He can have a normal count, normal normal motility, normal morphology, and still have a high DNA fragmentation rate. Um, what are the causes of DNA fragmentation? A lot of times it's genetic. It's inherent in the man and it tends to get older. Uh, uh, it tends to get worse as a man gets older. It can be environmental, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the things we're exposed to. Um, I'm going to talk about ICSI, which you see down there, which is the basic treatment that we do when there is high DNA fragmentation. But with Treatment for high DNA fragmentation, depending on how high it is, uh, we can usually get improvement by putting men on antioxidants uh, and vitamins. The most significant one is an amino acid called L-carnitine. L-carnitine improves DNA fragmentation 60% of the time, as does resveratrol, and the combination together uh, can do a good job. But remember, Sperm's on a three-month assembly line, so you're not going to know if it's working for three months. So this is a DNA fragmentation report, and part of it is a routine seam analysis. Here's a sperm count, and remember we said above 50 million, this is normal. Talks about motility, talks about morphology. Here's the DNA fragmentation index, and this is the report we get. As I said, normal is less than 25% in this sample. It's 10% normal. But there's a second sheet here. And it goes into more detail about the sperm. Now, keep in mind, sperm with high DNA fragmentation, the sperm tend to have big heads, okay? And if there's high DNA fragmentation, it'll automatically, you'll have poor morphology because part of morphology is the head size. But the most significant thing on this page is the one that talks about acrosomes. So acrosomes are the drills that drill into the sperm. And if you recall, I said, sperm has to drill into the egg, transfer its genetic information into the egg, so the male and female genet uh, genetic information can combine. In this situation, if you notice, 65% of the sperm have abnormal acrosomes. So regardless of the count, 65% of the sperm don't have drills. It doesn't keep them from getting pregnant, but it certainly makes it more difficult. We see it sometimes where 95% of the sperm don't have drills. What is considered normal abnormal acrosomes? Less than 40%, okay? So the, so the system can compensate 
if there's less than 40% acrosomes, but again, we can we we don't have ways of fixing acrosomes. Okay. There's no supplements you can give. Uh, the only thing you can give a guy is a time machine because it's associated with age. So every man loses acrosomes. It can happen as late as 45. I've seen it at age 22. And again, it doesn't fix. And if it doesn't fix and they aren't getting pregnant, and let's say you're that 91 to 95% that has abnormal acrosomes, um, they need IVF right off the bat. And I'll talk about I'll talk about that, but they need IVF right off the bat. So one of the values of doing this is when I when I see a couple, one of the first things we all, we we do on the male is we get a DNA fragmentation test. We see what his DNA fragmentation test is, but we also check his acrosomes. And if his acrosomes are mostly like highly abnormal, there's no point in trying any other treatment other than IVF. You can save them six months of fooling around with other methods that have an extremely low chance of working. So remember DNA fragmentation, remember abnormal acrosomes. What, what if you wanna order the test? Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, how you and your patients in the future will be able to order this test. So ICSI stands for intracytoplasmic sperm injection. In other words, we take an individual sperm and inject it directly into the egg to force fertilize it, okay? Prior to doing ICSI or ICSI with IVF, the only option a couple would have is to either remain childless, uh, adopt, or use donor sperm. Since we've been doing ICSI, it's changed things significantly. Because again, when we do IVF in a very, very, vigorous stimulation of a woman for IVF, we may get 25 eggs, which means if we use individual sperm, we only need 25 normal individual sperm. And as you saw from sperm counts, sperm counts are in the millions, okay? So we can use ICSI for very, very low sperm counts, for high DNA fragmentation. And when we have D high DNA fragmentation that we can't fix, we have a machine called Zymot, I'm going to quickly tell you what Zymot is. Zymot is a sperm sorter. And uh, if you recall, I mentioned that high DNA fragmentation sperm have big heads. The Zymot machine is you put the man's sperm in a well. There are channels leading from the well of different diameter size. And the sperm that don't that aren't as fragmented because the overall DNA fragmentation is all the sperm together, the sperm that have small heads have small have lower DNA fragmentation, and they'll travel down the narrower channel, and we can use those sperm for ICSI. And again, as I mentioned, if the man doesn't have drills, we can become the drill when we do ICSI. So this is an example of ICSI. Uh, this is an egg that's been retrieved. It's being held in place. That is a needle and you'll be able to watch and I'll give you a guided tour here. So if you notice, here's a sperm going into here. We inject the sperm directly into the egg. And although this looks brutal, this has been done for over 20 years and pregnancy rates are high and abnormality rates are low. It does not damage the egg. The, the person doing this has to stay away. Well, we got one more. I'll show you the next one. Yeah, it's hard to see here, but hold on for a sec. Yeah. So, oops, lost it again. This is the polar body right here. This is where all the genetics is. Okay, so you can't inject there or you ruin the egg. Okay, and let me get this started again. So the embryologist has oriented the egg in the proper place. He's picked up a little sperm and he's doing it one more time. And 
if he has 15 eggs, he or she has that, has 15 eggs, they do that 15 times. Um, so ICSI has changed our life. It's like incredibly significant how it has helped couples. Um, and what are the major advances that we have in the field of male fertility? Well, one of them is understanding how important a lifestyle is, okay? So good diets with antioxidants, vitamins, minerals, avoiding excess alcohol, cigarettes, and uh, obesity is frequently associated with male infertility. In men with incredibly low sperm counts, in other words, zero sperm seen on a semen analysis, they frequently still have some sperm production in their testicles. A microtesa here is a procedure where in the operating room, the man is asleep, his testicle is butterflied, open up, and under a microscope, you can actually see small little islands of sperm production, and we can obtain sperm, frequently enough sperm, to be able to do ICSI and uh, allow pregnancies to occur. And Zymod has really changed things for DNA fragmentation. And if you have any other questions about it later, you're certainly wel welcome to ask. But again, the, the reason Zymot is significant is the DNA fragmentation value you get is an average of all the sperm in the sample. So if someone is 30% DNA fragmentation, they have some sperm that are 10% fragmented, others that are 60% fragmented. The, the average is 30. By using Zymot, you can get those 10 percenters. Um, interesting, my okay. So, uh, when the couple comes to you, how do you improve sperm? Again, if it's low, don't fool around too long, you shouldn't do that. But just in general, what are the things you can do? Consider dietary changes, get an idea what's going on in their life. Uh, regular exercise is important, but not too much. Marathon runners, so the reason the testicles hang outside the body is because 37.5 is too hot. So uh, people who overwork out have poor sperm counts as well. Uh, bicyclists, um, they have pudendal, they, frequently they can have pudendal nerve problems from sitting on their bike. It can pro cause uh, problems with erections as well. And again, it's pretty obvious that you want to avoid harmful substances as well. So this is a plug for TRIO, by the way. Uh, so we are just beginning to start a new program called SEED. There's the acronym up there. It is a for couples who are interested in, for males, doesn't matter whether they're a couple or whoever, for males who are interested in finding about their fertility, uh, it is, all the, I mean, the tests that we're, we're doing above, blood tests, hormones, DNA fragmentation, all of those are done on a first visit there. Uh, they speak to one of our nurse practitioners in the beginning who tell them exactly what's going on. Um, if there is, a, and it's reviewed by a nurse practitioner, if there are any issues with the sperm, uh, they have an appointment that's expedited so they will see a trio reproductive endocrinologist much faster than waiting for an appointment. Um, we automatically, we have on-site fertility-based naturopaths. All our naturopaths do is fertility. They have, and I, I, there, there is, there's actually uh, a number of papers that they publish that show that uh, the uh, a number of the supplements that they prescribe can uh, improve sperm. And then if a urologist is needed to look after this man, again, we can expedite the appointment, the normal. And in fact, one word of advice, um, urologists on average know nothing about fertility. If you send a patient with a sperm problem to a general urologist, they'll have a cystoscopy, which is useless. They'll, be, they'll have blood tests. 
and they'll be told that, I don't know what's wrong with you. The, in the Toronto area, there are only, there's only one center for male fertility at Mount Sinai Hospital, Keith Jarvey, Kirk Lowe, and Ethan Grober. All they do is male fertility. Um, but again, it'll take you six months to a year to get an appointment. We can usually get them seen within six weeks. Okay. Uh, and again, we have a support group for men, support group for couples, and we can uh, do the extra testing. So it's uh, since we've already uh, introduced this just literally within the past month, uh, there the phones are the phones haven't stopped ringing. Okay. So uh, what's my bottom line? Uh, if uh, you're at all interested, especially with the SEED program, you can call TRIO and we'll send you a brochure uh, for uh, SEED testing. Our nurse practitioners will arrange it. And again, you the results, uh, if there are issues, uh, you won't be left hanging with, uh, yeah, the man won't be left hanging with the report, not knowing what to do they'll get consultations so they get a good idea of what their next step is. <laughs> and that's All it. right. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking, does anyone have any, um, any questions for Dr. Kadeski? I obviously answered every single question yeah, exactly i don't see any questions in the uh in the box if anyone does have a question i'll just give you a moment in the bottom of your screen you can see there's a q a box um so you can add your uh, question down there if you do have any i believe in the email you signed up for the talk as well there was um an email that you were sent when you got sent your Zoom link that you can send questions to as well. So if any, doesn't look like anyone has any questions here tonight, if anyone does have any questions or anything comes up or they want more information from either TRIO or Dr. Kadeski, you can send to that email that you'll find in your Zoom link um, webinar registration. So I think that is it for tonight. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Kadeski for the talk and have an enjoyable evening, everyone.